Okay, welcome. Um, this course is what you should know about construction defect lawsuits. Now, I want to say um, up front kind of who this course is for. Um, I have another course that you'll find in our, in our offerings that is called um, Building HOAs That Won't Sue You. That is, that course is, is kind of specifically tailored towards developers, home builders, um, and, and there are, of course, risks that, that that course goes over with. You, you develop an HOA and, and construction defect is one of those risks. HOA can band together, bring a construction defect lawsuit. This, law, this case, or this uh, course, touches on that some, um, touches on some of those risks, but it's broader than that. This doesn't only apply to developers and home builders. Construction defect uh, cases can be brought against anybody who's, who's building anything in, in somebody's home, in a commercial property, et cetera. So this course is, is designed um, to really be more applicable for, for the entire industry, most of the industry at least. Um, I, I think it will be useful if you're a developer and a home builder, um, but I would also recommend that you look at that other one if, if you kind of want to dive deeper into how does a homeowners association um, put you at risk and what can you do to guard against those risks because we're going to kind of skip over some of that, those issues in this course, save it for that, that other course, and um, so we can keep this one to kind of focus on a broader appeal. So what should you know about construction defect lawsuits? First of all, um, keep calm and don't shoot the messenger. So I know the construction defect is um, not a, a, it's not a fun lawsuit to be a part of um, if, if you're in the industry. And um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background here. Fortunately, I'm here doing this, this program to an empty room so you can't throw anything at me but uh, while, while I make some confessions here. Um, I am with VF Law by Al Fotheringham, and historically our firm had been heavily involved in construction defect litigation in Utah, and um, for a number of years we were on the we were on the other side, bringing construction defect lawsuits <clears throat> against builders and developers, and we we were here and and a major part of shaping a lot of that um, case law, a lot of that litigation. Our firm brought a lawsuit um, that resolved in, I think, 2009, 2010, I believe it was 2009, um, Davenport v. Davenport. Davenport was a community down in Lehigh, um, a townhome community that um, the HOA that we represented <clears throat> brought a lawsuit against the developer for some construction defects. At the time, the law was, was quite different in Utah. Um, it wasn't as developed. The, the construction defect law wasn't as developed, and there wasn't as clear of a path for um, for bringing lawsuits against against construction um, or for construction defects. And the Davenport case um, changed that in a lot of ways. The Davenport case was appealed to the Supreme Court, Utah Supreme Court, and the Utah Supreme Court in that case um, basically said, and we'll go over a lot of this basically said there's some obligations that Utah law hasn't recognized in the past. We're gonna to start to recognize them now. Obligations that a builder has or anybody you know, doing work on, in a, on a construction project has. And, um, and, and some of those obligations are inescapable and the owner of that property can, can sue for them. So um, we are uh, like I say, uh, myself and, and my colleague who's, who's with our firm here in Utah um, came on kind of after that and, and our push has always been let's work with the developers and so we're a firm who, who has that history and um, I think we can give you kind of an insider track and insider knowledge on what those construction defect losses look like. Um, I personally have always in my um, 12 years of practicing law I've always um, done real estate law and worked with developers and builders, and so I kind of have a, a different approach. But um, but don't shoot, don't shoot the messenger. Um, I am going to explain to you um, just kind of the black and white letter of the law of, of of under what circumstances you can be sued, and hopefully by doing that we can help you kind of see. Um, of course, I'm not giving you the practical the the 
sort of construction knowledge about how to build something. That's not me. That's not what I'm, I'm not going to try to do that. But, um, but hopefully by, by explaining kind of some of the practical side of, of who can sue you, under what circumstances you can be sued, you can kind of go into these, into the situations, approach your work in a way that um, uh, helps you avoid some of those situations. So quick overview here, and, and I hope you can see that screen well. Four things that we'll be discussing is who can sue. Um, who can be sued, what can you be sued for in the construction defect realm, because it's not everything. Utah law, um, even after Davenport, and, and I'll say since Davenport, there's been um, other cases that have sort of chipped away at the, uh, at, at the Davenport ruling in a sense. Uh, the, you know, Davenport seemed to open the gates a little bit. We've had cases since that for a number of reasons have have closed that gate a little bit further. So um, Davenport maybe made it look like, oh yeah, we can, you know, we can be sued in the construction industry really easily for construction defect. Um, cases that, that followed up on Davenport um, made it seem like, well, maybe it's not as easy as we might have thought. And, and we've had um, some statutory developments that have also helped protect the industry. But so we'll go over what can you be sued for. And, and the fourth thing that we'll talk about is how long are you at risk? Um, before I go into any of these, and, and frankly, part of it's because I just don't want to forget, um, it's not a specific point on the slides, but, but I want to discuss a matter that's a little bit outside of, of these four points. And one of the main developments that we've seen in the law when it comes to construction defect is, is the recovery piece. So, so you get sued for construction defect, um, you, uh, you get a judgment against you, and judgment's for a bunch of money. And you don't have the money to pay it, and so may, maybe, you, um, may, maybe you, you know, do some clever things with your business to kind of protect your, your assets. Maybe there's a bankruptcy involved, or whatever the case. Um, often what happens, usually what happens, is insurance gets involved. So you're not paying that bill yourself, insurance is paying that bill. And one of the big developments that we've seen over the last um, few years, we've continued tracking these, these cases, is that Utah courts have made it difficult for a litigant to recover after the fact. You know, they get their judgment, but then how do you actually recover that judgment? How do you get the money? <clears throat> they made it difficult to recover against the insurance. And there's been some rulings um, where the courts have said, and this gets a little bit technical, but the, the kind of hot button topic has been what is considered a, a, an incident under, under your insurance policy. Because your insurance will say if, there's, if an incident has occurred or an occurrence, um, incident or an occurrence, um, if there's been an occurrence, then, um, then we're going to cover that. And you know, simplifying it a little bit, but, but basically that's, that's what your insurance policy will say. But then we'll define what's an occurrence. And for instance, um, you know, your, your policy might say that, that um, if it was work done by a subcontractor that was substandard, you know, we're not going to cover that or, or whatever. And Utah courts have, have <clears throat> kind of, I don't want to say erred on the side, but leaned to the side of, uh, of not requiring the insurance companies to provide coverage in a lot of these cases. Now, that doesn't mean they made a broad statement to that effect, but it, but it just means that kind of case by case, as we've seen the cases come down, um, more and more we've seen cases where the, where the courts have said, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking at the policy and we don't think that the insurer has to cover this, this incident. So maybe that's good news in some ways because <clears throat> that could discourage some of the litigation. In other ways, though, it's not as good news because it means that, that there's not going to be insurance coverage. And if there's not insurance coverage, then that means that you know, you're personally on the hook for, for covering whatever losses there might be. I think my prediction would be is that what we'll start to see in the construction defect realm um, is a little bit of shift in the, the types of losses that, that are bring, being brought um, where one, attorneys will try to get around the things the courts say aren't covered by insurance. Um, so then we might see lawsuits about fiduciary duties and other things. And, and again, that's covered more in, in the um, building HOAs that won't sue you. But, um, but we might see kind of what you're being sued for exactly shift a little bit. I think the dollar amount might shift as well. You know, if you bring a $3 million lawsuit against, against a home builder, and especially if they're not a huge home builder, 
uh, they're going to have to tender that. It's going to go to the insurance. But you might see litigants saying, well, I'm not going to go after the whole kind of kit and caboodle, but I'm going to pick out a few things that, that I think were um, done poorly in my home, and I'll sue you on a $10,000 lawsuit. And, and then if your insurance doesn't cover it, we feel like we could probably recover against you on that judgment. So I think we'll see a shift, but I, don't think, I definitely don't think the construction defect is going away, but it is changing in Utah. Um, so start on the first bullet point then, who can sue you? Now, um, maybe this ages me a little bit, but if you remember these Geico commercials with the, with the caveman, so easy a caveman can do it. You know, and the whole, uh, the whole idea with these was um, the caveman took offense to saying something so easy a caveman can do it. That's kind, of, that's kind of how it is when it comes to lawsuits though. And, and you know, every attorney sees this. Anyone can sue you, right? And so that's not really what the question is, but, but it's, it's an important point. Yes, anyone can sue. They don't have to have a good case in order to sue. It's, it's fairly easy to, to go down to the court, download something online, fill it out, you know, and send it in and, and call that your complaint and then serve it on the other side and, and you have a lawsuit. Yeah, I can give you an example of this. I fairly recently um, was involved in a lawsuit where the, the person who I represented um, was, was with an HOA, was a board member on an HOA, and they had sent out voluntarily um, it said, hey, I, I think we were able to get this great discount for some HVAC systems. They, they uh, knew somebody who, who was offering a discount if they could get enough people in the community to sign up. He knew that a lot of people in the community needed um, to install some HVAC. Um, it was in Park City, so, it's, um, so they, didn't, they, didn't have, uh, they, did, they didn't have pre-installed systems on, on a lot of the units because they were older. So he just kind of voluntarily said, I'm going to see if I can gather up some enough people to, to get us this great discount. And he sent out the, the information and said, if you're interested, um, then here's who you need to call. And um, you know, let me know so I can kind of keep a list and see if we have enough people to, to get a discount. Um, one of the unit owners um, didn't get what he wanted out of it. The, the unit wasn't installed. And um, if, I, if I recall correctly, I think the unit wasn't even installed. And the um, service provider, you know, said that it's because they didn't want to install that unit this, for a number of reasons, and I won't go into the details. But um, but, but they had chosen after kind of discussing it with this unit owner, we're not going to put the, the the HVAC system in your unit. Um, you know, you need to go work with someone else. Unit owner got upset, sued the service provider, which isn't a you know big surprise. I mean, if if, if he's going to sue someone, it makes sense. I guess that's who he would sue. But then he also sued my client. And the only thing my client had done was, was send out a couple of emails that said, I think I can help you guys get a discount. Um, it's those type of lawsuits that, well, first of all, give attorneys bad names, but it's, it's those type of lawsuits that uh, you, you see and understand pretty clearly that anyone can bring a lawsuit. So obviously, when we're going over these um, principles, we're not saying that you can't be sued by anyone. Anyone can bring a lawsuit. The question is, um, who can bring a legitimate claim that maybe you should actually be concerned with and, and take some steps to guard against. So under construction defect, um, the class is kind of narrow. Who can sue you? Um, first of all, it has to be somebody who's, who's, uh, who's in privity of contract. Privity of contract, kind of a legalese that basically just means they're actually part of the contract. So you can't say, hey, um, you know, A and B over there had a contract and things didn't work out for them, and there was some trickle down that I got injured from, and so I'm gonna sue under that contract. Contract law doesn't work that way. You can only sue under a contract in most instances if you were actually part of the contract. You signed on the dotted line, or sometimes if you weren't a signer, the contract mentioned you specifically, said that this contract is supposed to benefit you. Most cases, if you didn't actually sign on the dotted line, you weren't actually named as a party in that contract, you can't sue under that contract. So that cuts off a big, a big group of people. You know, for instance, if you're a home builder, you build a home, original purchaser um, who purchased from you then goes and sells that home to someone else, that someone else isn't part of your contract and so they're barred from suing you um, for construction defect under a contract claim. Um, so you know, again, cuts off a lot of people. Um, 
Now, the second part, though, which is kind of a caveat to that, is anyone who is assigned rights under the contract. And so sometimes we'll see this um, where, like, homeowners associations have used this in the past, where they'll say, um, you know, we're not parties to the contract. Builder didn't sign a contract with the HOA. They maybe signed a contract with every member of the HOA individually, but not with the HOA as an entity. And so the HOA is not actually a party to the contract, um, but we've seen it where they will go to each unit owner and say, assign me your rights under the contract. And so the unit owner you know, signs a document that says, we're assigning you our rights. So it's, it's as if you stepped into our shoes under the contract. So the law does allow for that. So there is a little bit of a workaround there. Um, just because somebody wasn't the original party to a contract, they could assign out the rights to the contract. And that, that sometimes happens. Fortunately, there's a way to, to protect yourself against this, and you can simply restrict assignability in your contract. And I, I, recommend, I recommend doing that. Now, it's hard to give kind of a, a widespread recommendation because um, that could have implications that, that you don't intend for it to have. But, but for the most part, we could work something out. You probably want to be careful in your language, but we could work something out that restricts the ability of the other person to assign that contract um, to another. Another... Um, area where this where this becomes important is if you're a subcontractor um, and you know maybe the the contractor or the home builder had a had an agreement had a written contract with with a homeowner and then subs come in and do a bunch of work well the subs typically aren't a direct party to that contract um, that the, the homeowner and the builder had and so again that protects the subs from from construction defect um, at least for most construction defect claims because they weren't actually a party to the contract. Um, keep in mind though that they were a party to some contract. Uh, so they might not have been a party to the contract between the contractor and the homeowner, but they were a party to a contract between themselves and, um, and the general. So, so it kind of trickles down. So a lot of times what we see happen in, in lawsuits, and this isn't just construction defect, just in general, a lot of times what happens in lawsuits is, you know, you'll sue the person who you had a contract with, and if you win that lawsuit, you get judgment against them. But in turn, they're going to sue the person that they had a contract with until it trickles all the way down to the person who maybe was actually the one that, that caused the problem. Um, so, so you don't totally escape it from not being an original party. And then the third, um, third person, third group of people who can sue, and this is really sort of a totally different class. We're talking about being a party to the contract. There's a whole other class under Utah law that you can sue for negligence, and we'll talk about this in more detail in just a second. Um, if you personally suffered personal injury, you know, you got injured, um, got your leg broken or whatever, or you, you lost property, um, car got damaged or something else based on um, they, something you can trace back to construction defect, and we'll go we'll go into what that'll look like. That brings it to a whole different category, um, and that's something that you know there's not a lot you can do to guard against contractually, um, but just be aware that that's a third third class of people who can sue. If you got injured, then then the loss is okay. You you can sue whoever is responsible for that injury. So who can be sued? Well, this kind of parallels. Uh, the last analysis. If, if you can only sue um, if you're a party to the contract, the same goes for being sued. You can only be sued if you were a party to the contract. And again, that goes back to like subcontractors, et cetera, are going to be in a different position than a general contractor if you're the one who actually signed your name to the dotted line. Now, and again, though, that's unless it's a personal injury issue, and we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. All right. So what can you be sued for? So first, um, first thing, and I've already alluded to this a ton, a lot of times your construction defect lawsuits is, is over breach of contract. Um, there's a tip here, and that is that if you can be sued for breach of contract, then of course be careful what you say in that contract. Um, be careful in how specific you get in sort of your regular boilerplate provisions because you know, you might think, oh, I like having this really specific provision, but if you're going to use that provision over and over, you might sort of accidentally use it in a case that, where it doesn't really fit really well, and then they can hold you to it, and then that's a really easy construction defect claim. Um, watch out for your plans and specifications provisions. I'm sorry if you, if you 
listened to, attended my, my contracts course. I'm going to go over um, a little bit of what's, what was gone over there. Um, plans and specifications can be, can be kind of um, uh, an area where, where you can have a lot of problems. Uh, you, you definitely, in my recommendation, should use and reference plans and specifications in your contracts because it makes it really clear between the parties of what's going to be done, what's the project going to look like, etc. But you can also really step in it by, by referencing your plans and specifications if you're not careful. And, um, and again, I've given this example, so I'm, I'm sorry if you've heard it before, but, but um, I was involved in a, in a lawsuit where, where the, the home builder referenced the plans and specifications in the contract, but just kind of used that term broadly without specifying um, exactly you know, which versions of the plans, what's all included in plans and specifications, because specifications, you, know, you could argue that means a lot of things. Does that mean an email that you know, we sent back and forth that specified um, you know, what, what things would look like or, or whatnot? So, so you want to be detailed um, if you're using plans and specifications as like a term in your contract. Um, I recommend saying that the plans and specifications we're referring to are attached and attach those as an exhibit. You also want to be detailed, and, and this would happen in the same lawsuit, about um, how do those get modified? What happens if we have um, a meeting, and in, in this one it was, it was a design center meeting. There was a design center that both parties went to. They walked away from that design center meeting understanding two different things. Homeowner walked away thinking, I'm going to have a finished basement because he, he had seen in the plans one of the pages showed a finished basement, and that was emailed to him. Um, builder walked away thinking there's no finished basement. That was pretty clear in the design meeting as he saw it. And, you know, we talked about finishes. We didn't talk about finishes in the basement, etc. So be careful on your details in the contract, especially when it comes to plans and specifications. Make sure that if you're using that, everybody's on the same page about what you're referring to. Everybody's on the same page about how are those plans and specifications affected, you know, by amendments, by meetings, by design center um, meetings, those kinds of things. Um, you know, be specific about how those plans are modified, and that can help you avoid a breach of contract case. And then the third thing that often is not thought about, far too often is not thought about, is your HOA governing documents. Um, you know, again, I'm trying not to buy, delve too deeply into the HOA side in this course because I want this one's kind of more applicable to everyone. But, but if you are dealing with HOA documents, then that's one that could come back to bite you because your HOA documents are considered a contract under Utah law. Um, and so if your documents get specific about things that the developers to do, things the builders are to do, and sometimes they do. Sometimes you'll have HOA documents that get specific on those things. Then, then what might happen is you don't recognize that, you don't remember that that's in there, you do something contrary, and then you have what's basically a breach of contract claim against you. Um, I, I've been involved in a situation where, where the developer said specifically um, in the HOA documents, and, and, and by the way, the HOA documents, I mean, the great thing is, is that if you're the declarant, you control these so we can amend them and shape them in a way that's favorable to you. But I've been involved in a situation where the developer said specifically in there a certain way that they would grade um, some common area, some landscaping, and, um, and there was a dispute that arose a few years after, after the development had kind of been underway and, and units were selling um, that the, the HOA claimed that the, the grading wasn't done per specs in the, in the governing documents and as a result there was some flooded basements and that sort of thing. My recommendation would be if you're a de developer in that situation, just don't say that in the governing documents. There's no need to, to get that specific in the documents. It's, you're setting up a situation for yourself where it's too easy to forget that those kind of specifications were in there and um, you're kind of setting up a standard that, that is unnecessary to, to be held against. Okay, um, so that's the breach of contract issue. This next issue, um, breach of, of implied and um, express warranties, this goes back to the Davenport case that, that I, I had brought up. And this was kind of one of the big takeaways from, from the Davenport ruling uh, back in 2009. And before that case, Utah was considered to not recognize um, any of these implied warranties that most other states recognized against a, a home builder. And, you know, I say home builder, but this is also going to apply to any any sort of project, any kind of construction. 
And what, what the court said in the Davenport case that kind of changed everything, and, and this is a quote here, I'm going to read the quote. They said, under Utah law, in every contract for the sale of a new residence, a vendor in the business of building or selling such residences makes an implied warranty to the vendee that the resident is constructed in a workmanlike manner and fit for habitation. So we call this the implied warranty of, of workmanship or habitability. Um, the court in Davenport made it very clear, despite what the past has been, Utah courts now recognize an implied warranty of workmanship and, and habitability. Now that's huge. And they said specifically in that case, you can't get out of this warranty. You can't contract your way out of this warranty. Um, many of you might have in your contracts that there are no warranties for workmanship or warranties of habitability. Um, you know, you're waiving, you might say to the person signing, you're waiving those warranties. Um, but the fact is, is that the court specifically said they can't waive those warranties. So that's probably not going to be a provision that, that's upheld under the law. So let's, let's talk about what that means. So what are you warranting? And again, you know, you don't have to say that you're warranting it. The law automatically says you're providing a warranty on this house, uh, like it or not. Here's what it does. Here's what you do warrant against. Um, latent defects. So of course, you know, latent defect meaning something that um, that arises later that maybe you don't you don't see just by walking through the property. And that's important because if it's if it's a defect that you can see when you walk through the property, you're going to have a lot of protection there because because the homeowner has an opportunity to inspect. Um, and if they, if they see it or if they should have seen it, they should have noticed it and they pay you anyway, um, they buy the house anyway or, or whatever the case is, then, um, then there's a good argument that they've waived any sort of claim on that defect. So we're talking about latent defects, things that can't be seen, things that, sh that aren't reasonably going to be noticed. So latent defects that manifest after the purchase um, that are caused by improper design, material, or workmanship. This is basically quoting Davenport. It's almost verbatim. Um, caused by improper design, material, or workmanship, and create a question of safety or make the house unfit for habitation. Um, unfit for habitation, the, you know, that could sort of be interpreted a lot of ways. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's... Um, you know, that there's like no roof on it and snow is coming into the house or whatever. Um, the standard is a little bit lower than that. Um, and it's not, it's not super easy to, to define though, but, but basically if a place is, you know, somewhere that that's not reasonably, where, where no reasonable person could, could expect to, to live in those conditions, you, you're going to have a habitability issue. The implied warranty does not warrant against building code violations. Now that's a surprise to a lot of people. And it's specific, again, under that Davenport case, the court specifically said that. Um, there's not some kind of warranty, there's not some kind of obligation by, uh, at least as, as far as the relationship between the builder and the, the, the homeowner or the building owner goes. There's not um, some kind of guarantee that, that, that the building code is going to be followed exactly. And so we hear this, and we've heard this over the years um, a lot from, from homeowners who'll say, well, you know, this wasn't built to code. I know code. I, I looked up the code or whatever, and the X, Y, and Z wasn't built to code. And um, the fact is, is that that's not grounds for a lawsuit in, in, under Utah law. Some states it is. Under Utah law, it's, it's not. Now, that's important because you can change that by saying in your contract something that indicates that you're going to build exactly to code. If you say that, then your contract now says it, and it kind of doesn't matter what the Davenport court said. So, so don't do that. And that's not, you know, being being slimy, it's not, it's, what it's doing is that you're not putting on yourself a standard that um, the law doesn't require you to put on yourself and open yourself up to those possible lawsuits because there might be something in code that was unknown or that can be interpreted different ways or, or whatnot. I've seen that again in contracts. I've seen it in, in governing documents where you'll say that, that, that the code applies or things we built to code and, and just know that you're, you're creating an additional burden for yourself that the law doesn't require if you do that. Um, the implied warranty does not warrant against um, any possible or each and every little defect. And, and the Davenport, the way that they said this, they, they said, and this is a quote from them, the court said, no house is built without defects. The courts recognize that. So, um, so this implied warranty isn't necessarily saying that, that things are absolutely perfect because, you know, that, that's just not, not realistic. Um, 
so it, again, it's, it's more about, about reasonableness, but habitability and, and workmanlike um, manner. So what we often see then is in contracts, um, builders will rely on, uh, on these sort of prepackaged warranties, um, you know, a, a pre-purchased warranty. You use a third party. You say, hey, we're going to, um, you know, purchase this warranty for you. And then if you have issues, then, you know, you deal with kind of this third party service in the hopes that, and there might be other reasons for it too, but, but I know that at least, at least in the legal field, there's kind of some, uh, some thinking that, you know, in the hopes that if we have this warranty and this um, service that will take care of warranty issues, then maybe that gets us out of some of the liability on these um, implied warranties that the law says that, that you're automatically subject to. Um, that can be helpful. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't disparage that. That can certainly be helpful, but just know that, that having a prepackaged warranty that you're offering to a, um, a homeowner or to a building owner certainly isn't a guarantee that, that you're, you're, you're taking care of all the warranty issues. Um, and in my experience, sometimes these warranties really cover pretty minimal things and there still would be quite a bit of room for a, a, an owner to come back and say, you know, I, I have these issues, these workmanlike issues or these habitability issues that if I go back to my warranty and they take care of, you know, what they'll take care of, there's still a lot of issues left over that, that I think the, the builder is responsible for and, and they could have a le legitimate lawsuit. So, so I'm not saying not to use those, but what I am saying is don't think that by using those you've escaped any possible liability under, um, under the implied warranty part of Utah law. Um, just be aware that, that you, you probably still have some, some responsibilities um, and some liabilities that could creep up. So that's, that's the warranty side. Okay, so you can look at this in sort of three pieces. There's the contracts side, contract obligations under the law that you could be sued for for, for um, construction defect. And there's ways to take care of that by saying the right things in your contract and um, you know, handling your contracts in, a, in the right way. There's the warranty side of the law. And again, there's, there's, not, there's really no way of getting out of the, those warranties. Um, you know, you might have some strategies for passing off some of those responsibilities on other parties and that sort of thing. But, but the warranty side is more just kind of just know that, that you have these warranty responsibilities under the law. There's not much you can do to, to, to get out of them, um, to escape that liability. Um, it's more just that you need to be aware that it's there. And then the third side, the third way that you can be sued for construction defect is a negligence claim. So in Utah, unlike some other states, there's, there's no such thing really as a claim for negligent construction, for a construction defect law based on negligent construction if you are the party to a contract. And that's because um, there's a sort of rule of law that says basically you have to select. If, you, if, you're, if you're in a contract with somebody, um, the contract is your, is your ticket to any sort of recovery against them. And you can't, you can't say, hey, I know I have this contract with you um, and you didn't do the work in the way that I liked. And the contract doesn't cover it, but I'm going to sue you for negligence. You, you can't do that. Because um, there, there's a rule of law that says when you're in the contract with somebody, um, the contract is, is the is defines the legal relationship between you. So for the most part, um, a homeowner who's the original homeowner who contracted with the, the party who did the, the work um, isn't going to be able to bring a negligence claim against you because they don't think that the, the work was done in a way that you know meets the standard of the industry. Those type of losses don't really exist in Utah, except in this sort of somewhat narrow circumstance. And that is if you, if you, the homeowner, suffered personal injury um, or you had property damage. But when we say property damage, there's, there's been a lot of ink spilled over what kind of property we're talking about. And when we talk about this rule that says, you know, you have to sue under the contract and you can't sue under other ways, um, the law says unless there's damage to other property. And so that's where all the ink has been spilled over. What does other property mean? Um, you know, is, is citing other property from, from, you know, the rest of the construction is, you know, and there's been a lot of, um, a lot of litigation over that 
for the most part, if, it, if it's really anything to do with, with the structure itself, it's probably not gonna be considered other property. So I have a picture up here of um, the garage falling on a car and that's, and that's deliberate because when we're talking about other property, then you know, we, we can get into a lot of um, kind of nerding out legally on, on what that might involve um, in the house, um, structures in the house or attached to the house. And, and again, like I said, for the most part, if it's, if it's something that could be considered part of the structure, then it's probably not gonna be considered other property, at least in Utah. Um, so if somebody's gonna bring a negligence claim against you saying that your construction was negligent or you know, it didn't meet kind of industry standards, you're probably not gonna, they're probably not gonna be able to prevail with anything attached to the house. But something like a car, you know, they have something in the garage and, and you have a beam fall or something and it damages the car, um, damages furniture, uh, damages, you know, some equipment or something that's not part of the structure. They possibly could bring a negligence claim in that situation. And that gets them outside of this rule of law that says that they have to sue under the contract. That's the only way they can sue. Um, or they had to be a party to the contract and it kind of puts them in this whole other realm. And, and in a sense, it's not really construction defect in my mind, although we usually lump it under the construction defect realm because it's really more just a negligence issue at that case. And in, in the world of negligence, and um, you know, that, that term gets tossed around a lot, but under the law, negligence is a really specific thing. In the world of negligence, um, you know, anytime somebody is injured and they can trace that injury back to something that someone did wrong, uh, something that someone did substandard, you're gonna have a negligence claim. So, so the way that I see it is, um, is that that's just no difference when we're talking about construction. So it's not your standard construction defect lawsuit, but it is another area where you might have liability. Um, the other thing, so we talked about damage to, per, to, to other property, also damage to the person, you know, so, so take that same situation, a garage, a beam falling in the garage. If somebody was out in the garage when that happened and you know, they get hit on the head and taken to the hospital and they have all sorts of hospital bills, then that also is gonna get them outside of that, all those contract rules. And, and it's gonna say, yeah, you can sue um, whoever built that property, regardless of whether you're part of the contract or whatever, you can sue them for, um, for negligence uh, if, if you think you have a claim there. And again, how do you guard against that? Um, you know, other than uh, other than you know doing good work, there's there's really not a lot that can be done by contract, especially knowing that someone doesn't, doesn't even have to be a party to the contract to have one of these claims. There's really not a lot you can do there legally. I um, mean, of course, there's insurance solutions and and other things, but um, it's more just know that that's another claim that can be legitimate against you. There is a fourth one. And this one is, is probably a pretty narrow one, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but, but you can also be sued for fraudulent non-disclosure or negligent misrepresentation. Um, so, I mean, there's the really obvious things under this if you just flat out lie to someone. If, if you know there's some kind of issue behind the walls that you're just kind of counting on them never seeing and you just lie about it, then of course you, you can be sued if, if they discover it. Um, but where this, where this comes into play uh, and more often, and something you might want to be aware of is if you're involved in a project that wasn't yours originally, but you're doing something to it. So you come back in after the fact and there's a big renovation project. Sometimes we see this with condo conversions. You know, somebody will take an industrial building and they'll want to come in and build it out into condos and, and make a condominium um, project out of it. And maybe it's a building that was 15 years old and they're going to you know, kind of, um, you know, do it up and, and make it nice again. Um, this, all of these sort of principles of law sort of reset in that situation. And especially as it pertains to, to this um, negligent misrepresentation or, or non-disclosure. And, and so where that comes into play is if, if in the process of renovating or converting or whatever you're doing, you discover things that, that are defective and you don't disclose that to whoever you're selling the project to, or whoever's paying you to, to do the project, um, then you could be liable. And this, the, the risk of liability is even more serious in a situation where you're kind of renovating and then, and then selling the whole project, flipping, or, or, if, or again, if you're doing a condo conversion, you know, you're doing some major reconstruction in there, and then you're selling individual units. There, there's a real risk there that if you discovered something 
that you don't disclose, you could really have, have problems. So you want to make sure that in those types of situations, you are doing some really good, robust um, uh, disclosures in writing. And there's even probably some, some risk of liability that if there's something that you didn't actually discover, but you should have discovered it. So knowing that you might be responsible for um, for claims that, that you don't necessarily discover, but maybe should have discovered, then one tip that, that I would give that um, I think is a good practice is that if you're doing like a condo conversion or a big renovation, that, that you get a third party to come through to like a really good um, inspection, have them write you a report, and then just disclose that report to, to whoever you sell to. Um, you know, obviously, obviously nobody wants to try to sell a product and say, oh, by the way, here's all the potential uh, potential problems, but um, hopefully there won't be really anything significant, and, and legally it's going to save you a lot of liability. Um, and there's yet a fifth one, and that's breach of fiduciary duties. If, if you're building HOAs, that's another way you can be sued is by breach of fiduciary duties. I'm not going to go into that here, and again, I'll cover that a lot in the building HOAs that won't sue you. That's kind of a whole different um, realm that, that will spend um, spend some time talking about on that one. Um, the last thing that, that we need to cover then is how long are you at risk? Um, how long do you have for when, you know, one of these lawsuits to take place? When can you relax? There's, there's sort of a, um, a trope in the law where you know, we like to say that every day that passes is, is one more day where, you know, that, we've, that we've gotten closer to the statute of limitations settling on, on a legal malpractice claim. So, and that's kind of how it works. You know, you're in business long enough and, and you hope that, that some of the things that, you, that you've done uh, that you might get sued for is just going to pass with time. And that is the case. So it's especially true with construction defect um, because the statute, so let me, I guess, back up a little bit and say, usually in the law, we're dealing with what we call a statute of limitations. And you're probably familiar with that term. Basically, statute of limitations says um, you, a party has so long, so many years to sue if they feel like they've been wronged. And depending on what the lawsuit might be, you know, if we're talking construction defect, that's one deadline. If we're talking about a negligence claim, that's a different deadline. Um, you know, so under the law, it's kind of categorized under uh, breach of contract. For instance, here's a good example. If you have a written contract, then you have six years to sue for breach of that contract. If you have a verbal contract, you have four years. So the law kind of says, what's the situation? and we're going to give you so many years based on the situation. Usually the way the statute of limitations works is that the clock starts ticking from the time that you discover the claim um, or that you should have discovered the claim. So, you know, breach of contract, somebody does you wrong in a contract and maybe they, it took a, a year ago, they did something they weren't supposed to do under the contract, you didn't discover it until now. Um, the clock doesn't start ticking until now because you just discovered it. So you have six years from now then to sue them. And construction defect, what Utah law says is that it's actually what we refer to as a statute of repose. And a statute of repose is different. A statute of repose is a hard deadline that, that doesn't take discovery into account. Um, so it's better, really, if, if you're the one who's trying to you know, let that statute run. And so statute of repose says that from the time that, that the incident occurred, um, you have so many years to sue. And, and it's six years. It's a little bit complicated under Utah law, but, but basically we're looking at six years from the time that the, the construction occurred before a party can, can sue you, regardless of when they discover it. Um, that's the basic law. And so there's things that you can do um, under Utah law for limiting that statute of repose. And one thing that the law um, our statute references is limiting it by contract. And, and our statute kind of, in a roundabout way, says that you can limit your statute of repose um, in your contracts. And so we see that happen. Uh, what will happen is that you'll say to your, you know, for instance, if it's a, if it's a um, rep C uh, for new construction, you can say in that rep C, you only have one year to bring a construction defect claim. And that's, that's something that we see fairly commonly. Um, but you got to be careful because there are problems that can happen if you limit the statute too much. The first is that you can limit your ability to bring what are called pass-through claims. And kind of alluded to this earlier, um, a lot of times what happens in a lawsuit is you have the original party who sues, they sue whoever they were in contract with, 
that person might say, well, it wasn't really my fault because I hired someone else and they did the work, so then you sue that person because that's who your contract is with. And maybe, they, maybe that person even kind of says the same thing. It wasn't really me, I hired someone else, they sue that person. And if you've ever been in a lawsuit, you know that things take a long time. And it can very conceivably take more than a year to get down to that right person who actually was the one who you know, na- nailed the nails into the wall and, and created a problem. Um, so if you limit your statute of repose too much, you could limit your own ability to, to get recovery from the right person. And what could happen is you could get a judgment against you and you didn't have enough time to kind of go find that right person and make sure that that, that judgment kind of passes on to them. So you don't want to limit it too much. Um, the other thing that, and this is sort of theoretical, I frankly haven't seen court cases on this, but I think it's very likely we could. Um, it's sort of a fairly new trend in, in Utah to see these limitations in, in, the, in the purchase contracts. And so they haven't totally been tested in court. But what I'm a little bit nervous about is that if you limit your statute of repose too much, then what could happen is that the courts could come back and say, you know, that is actually a breach of what we call the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Um, it's common law that, that every contract has an implied covenant in it, that there's an implication that every party is going to deal fairly with each other. And there's some case law in Utah that says that implied covenant includes um, not doing anything that's going to limit the other person or, or eliminate the other person's right to, to get you know, what they deserved under the contract. And I think that uh, I have the quote up here, contracting parties must refrain from actions that will intentionally destroy or injure the other party's right to receive the fruits of the contract. I think what we could end up with is somebody bringing a claim that's saying, you limited my time to sue you so much that I couldn't really reasonably discover if something was actually wrong with the product. And so I didn't really have a fair opportunity to get what, what I deserve under the contract. And, and I think they might have a decent claim if they do that if you've limited it too much. So, you know, obviously you can't say, you shouldn't be saying, you only have six months to sue me, three months to sue me. I think that you, you would run a risk of that not being enforceable in court. Um, what about one year? One year we see pretty commonly. Um, I, I think that that might be enforceable, but you know, everything's gonna be according to the, the specific facts of the case. Um, I, I personally wouldn't push it um, any shorter than, than one year in, in your kind of normal contract, your normal circumstances. So those, the, that's a rundown of the construction defect law in Utah, things that you should know. Hopefully gave you some tips that um, kind of have some practical application that will help you avoid some potential liability. You're welcome, since we're doing this virtually, welcome to give me a call or shoot me an email with questions that you had from the presentation. Thanks.